Just ahead on Black Issues Forum, the president and CEO of the U.S. Black Chambers, Ron Busby, joins to talk about the need for federal support for Black-owned businesses. Then, our panel weighs in on the threat of the Delta variant. Stay with us. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. There is no question today's business landscape is absent. Many of the black owned businesses that were thriving just a year ago, in fact, because many of them shut down for good due to COVID, there's been a 41% drop in black business activity. I'd like to welcome Ron Busby Sr., a former small business owner and corporate executive, now president and CEO of the U.S. Black Chambers, Inc. Mr. Busby, thank you so much for joining us on Black Issues Forum. Thank you for having us this morning. Absolutely. Can you just share, it. as a background, you know, what was at the heart of so many black businesses having to shut down, even in view of the American Rescue Plan? Well, as you stated, during the months of February 2020 through April of 2020, we lost 41% of black owned businesses representing about 442,000 businesses closed during that period of time. And it was really a trifecta impact, a three-legged stool, if you'd say, the first leg being the virus itself. And so many people from our communities were called essential workers, having to go in and because of our living conditions, because of where we live in our communities, because of the conditions, uh, many African-Americans were forced to go to work and many of us uh, were dying. Uh, the second leg of that stool was the stimulus package itself or the lack thereof. And the majority of black owned businesses, even though it was a $349 billion stimulus package, it was announced on a Friday. And by that Saturday afternoon, 250 billion of those dollars had already been awarded to 50 publicly white traded firms without having ever a conversation about did you lose revenue? Did you have to lose people? Did you have to lay off? no conversations about what the impact were, which left all of the rest of America's businesses biding for that last few dollars that were left. Many black businesses left out of that equation. Actually, 76% of black firms said they either got no funding at all or far less than what they need. So and was it a matter of not getting to the table quickly enough? A combination of not having enough but then the payroll protection plan was a program that really did not address the needs of black owned businesses. Across the country, we own and operate 2.6 million black businesses, but of that 2.5 million have no employees. So you really left only with 114,000 black owned firms that had payroll. So you had a program that was there to protect the employee and not the employer. Gotcha. And so the majority of black firms are sole proprietors that did not have the opportunity to participate in the largest stimulus package that this country has seen. And then the third leg of that all happening during the same time was the murder of George Floyd. And that happened across the country. We combined all three, we lost a ton of our businesses and many of them are still facing uh, the repercussions of trying to reopen. And we now, did not have good information coming from the federal government as well as state and local officials either. Well, and now we've got the Delta variant out there that might affect businesses and economy. And I think that people are talking about uh, their concerns about another shutdown. Uh, what do small business owners and banks uh, need to be doing to position themselves right now? We told folk early on, it is about relationships. We've heard so often that black business owners don't have the financial literacy. And we say that is definitely a farce. Black business owners, the most educated, have more postgraduate degrees than any other ethnic business owner in the country. It's about having relationships. And so often, banks have not marketed to Black-owned businesses. Uh, many Black-owned businesses have been deterred uh, from dealing with, black, with dealing with banks in general because of the negative relationships they're having. So what we're telling our business owners across the country is make sure that in these times, before the next pandemic, before the next variant, before the next emergency, establish relationship, find a CDFI, find a black owned bank. We know that black banks make 70% of their loans to black homeowners as well as black business owners. And so we're saying, let's take this proactive effect 
Go out, make those relationships. Tell your banker, hey, this is what I'm foreseeing that I'm going to need. And ask now what you're going to have to provide to that bank to ensure that you have the best opportunity to be able to get the funding that you need to stay around. Well, let's talk about the role of the federal government and their responsibility uh, to help build black wealth, to support black entrepreneurs, and um, how the current infrastructure package um, addresses some of, some of those responsibilities. Great question. And so, Deborah, I want you to understand that the U.S. Black Chamber uh, is across the country. We have 150 black chambers uh, in 42 states with a membership base of 385,000 businesses. Our five pillars deal with advocacy, access to capital, contracting opportunities, entrepreneurial training, and then chamber development. The reason why I say that is because our first pillar is around policy creation. We want to make sure that when the federal government makes a comment like from the president of the United States while he was in Tulsa that he wanted to increase the spend from the federal government from 5% to 15%, that he has the resources to be able to do that. In today's environment, especially over the last 50 years, when business owners in our communities have issues, the solution usually is around minority programs, diversity and inclusion. And I say we're not a diverse community. We're not minorities. We're black business owners that have unique challenges and unique needs. And so you can't say, well, hey, we've created minority programs, but we're looking to do business with black owned businesses. It's not really the same. Minority businesses include women, include gays and lesbians, Asians, Hispanics, Native Americans. In today's environment, black businesses need specific solutions. And so when you have a president that says, hey, I want to increase my spend with black firms, you got to make sure that there's intentionality in reference to policy that's being created. And so the U.S. Black Chamber is here to make sure that when we talk about creating policy for black businesses, that it starts with making sure that the programs that are being created are for Black-owned businesses. Right and does now, the current today, infrastructure program provide for that? The U.S. Black Chamber came out with its own program to make sure that we are certifying Black-owned businesses. Right now, as a Black-owned business, I'm certified as a minority-owned business, which makes it extremely difficult for the federal government to find us, to do business with us, and to create programs. Usually when we talk to corporate America as well, they will say, well, yeah, Ron, we'd love to do more business with black businesses, but we either can't find them or they don't have the size and the scale. And so the U.S. Black Chamber created our Buy Black certification, B-Y-B-L-A-C-K.U-S. It allows the federal government, it allows corporate America, as well as black people that are looking to support black businesses where they can find them where they can find out more information and where we can provide the resources that they need to collaborate and to grow. And let me ask you, as we advocate for black owned businesses and buying black and banking black, how does that support an, uh, the idea of a unified America and get away from the two Americas? During the last five years, we heard a lot about making America great again. And as black people, we say, well, we want America to be great as well. But in order for there to be a great America, there must be a great black America. And in order for there to be a great black America, there must be great black businesses. Because we know that the creation and the sustainability in our communities comes from our entrepreneurs. Many times they're the leaders of their communities. They hire from within their communities. They spend other dollars within their communities. And to ensure that we have great communities, we've got to make sure that we have great black owned businesses. And when we do that, we will have a great America. I'm not sure that there will ever be one great big America for everyone to get involved in, but it starts with making sure that black business owners, black homeowners, black communities have the resources and the relationships that they need to make sure that we're sustainable across the country. Ron Busby, thank you so much for your comments and for your insight this morning. Thank you for having us.
This week, Governor Roy Cooper announced the statewide mask mandate will end July 31st. This despite an increase of 43 percent in new COVID infections. According to Health and Human Services, 99 percent of cases and 98 percent of hospitalizations are among those who are unvaccinated. And 75 percent of sequenced cases are due to the Delta variant. And concern over its impact is growing. Here to talk about it, I'd like to welcome Mary C. Curtis of the Equal Time podcast, business owner Leonardo Williams, and Dr. Delon Canterbury of the African American COVID-19 Task Force in Durham. I want to open up with you, Mary. While the governor has stated that the mask mandate will end, he's still advising that masking be continued in classrooms. Now, given the numbers of what's happening with COVID cases, what do you think the clear message should be and are leaders making that message? Well, the governor and other leaders are walking a fine line because they're trying to bump up those percentages and convince people, but to do it without blaming them or shaming them. And in, with schools, uh, it's really difficult and complicated because different school systems and counties have different rules. Uh, but I think the message is that for so many in elementary school, they are too young to get that vaccine. So uh, there are, there's a lot of uh, focus on trying to keep them with masks and the staff and others in the school to protect them. In high schools, some are eligible, but still you don't have a high percentage. So I think the focus will be let's protect the entire community as we're going forward. And also to emphasize that those numbers are going up slightly. So he'll be wanting to make that message clear that for the protection of the community, you need to mask, but at the same time, to get people who haven't gotten it yet to get out there and get the vaccine, because that's important, without blaming them for not getting it uh, as yet. It is a fine line, and it's very much about people taking the personal responsibility to make sure that the public environment is safe. So, Leonardo, you know, we just talked to Ron Busby about COVID's impact on black businesses. Now we're dealing with the Delta variant. Some fear another shutdown. Clearly getting back to normal is in the interest of our entire economy, but are black businesses, bis business owners rather, leading the charge or doing their fair share to educate communities about the choice of uh, vaccinating and what the impacts could be. Right. So, you know, uh, getting back to normal is in the interest of our entire economy, uh, but it's also in the interest of all of us personally, you know, and we have to be truth tellers. We have to tell that, you know, we have to communicate with our community, especially as business owners, with our customer base, the importance of our sustainability in order for us to stay alive and keep the doors open. Uh, you know, it, we're going to need their, we're going to need them there. But that means, you know, we need everyone to take on their responsibility personally to get vaccinated. Uh, we've been doing our part, uh, you know, as a small business in Durham, small black business in Durham. And um, but just across the board in Durham, we're doing fairly well. We have to do the same in our rural areas. Dr. Canterbury, do you think, I mean, you're a, a small business owner as well. Are businesses receiving uh, the support that they need on the federal and local levels to educate communities um, and to uh, advocate or ed just educate on the vaccine? It's a great question. We do see federal support. We are seeing more tax dollars going to funding to educate these communities. However, we have a long way to go. As an owner of geriatrics and also as a member of the task force, we still have social barriers that impact really results and care and education. And a lot of that is financial capital. And really the people that are facing the communities and trying to educate on the impacts of COVID are still looking for funding to do their job. And when you have these gaps, similar to what we see with the gaps of COVID vaccination, it's going to seep into business and our commerce and our economy. And we see it today as a lot of black businesses still aren't getting the funding for loans from government programs. I will say, though, we are seeing more of an influx to address these needs. And honestly, it all ties in to what we can do as business owners and educating our communities. And it seems, Mary, that the business community has been a strong voice in pushing for reopening. But then here we have, um, you know, mask mandates being lifted and the Delta variant pushing in. What do you think the tolerance of the community might be for 
reshutting things or closing things back down. Well, there is no tolerance for that. And I feel that so many uh, folks are acting as if this is in the rearview mirror. And once we've taken off the mask, that we shouldn't have to put them on. So that's when, as the other panelists were saying, you see businesses on their own, some of them requiring the masks. It's to their comfort level. And also we see them trying to staff up. So they're trying to get people to come to work with them, uh, whether it's in their businesses or teachers coming back to the schools who are comfortable getting out there. So I think the public might, you know, it, right now, when you take the mask mandate away, we're really going on the honor system. Uh, and some of the people have been vaccinated and some have not. Uh, and we know that it's become a political thing. And so there is some resistance. You know, I just was on a flight and you see some people really cooperating and other people not wanting to cooperate. So uh, it, I think it will be difficult, but businesses themselves will be setting mask mandates uh, and enforcing that. Uh, and But at the same time, as the business folks on your panel uh, know, uh, they have to open their businesses again, and if people are uncomfortable with that, uh, they are going to have to be comfortable with the rules that they're setting. Mm -hmm. And I know, I mean, Leonardo and uh, Dr. Canterbury weigh in on this because you're small business owners, and you know that you cannot discriminate in serving people. So what's the imperative to, for folks to get vaccinated? And they, can, they don't have to wear their masks. Uh, they don't have to social distance. They can come into businesses and be served. What's... You know, we're trying to get up to 70 percent. And like Mary said, there's kind of the massaging of the numbers to make it look like we have more people vaccinated <clears throat> than we really need. So what can you do as business owners? What kind of support do you need to do that? Leonardo. Yeah, you know, I'll use this analogy. We are being squeezed into a corner. Uh, when the CDC initially announced uh, you know, uh, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. And if you are, do you should? Right. <laughs> we, I mean, our business was hit so hard because we simply made a public statement. We simply said, wear your mask to your table. When you walk in the restaurant, wear your mask. When you get to your table, take it off. We received maybe about 15, like, one-star reviews on Google. Uh, you know, so you have this, you can't discriminate, right? Uh, Have you gotten pushback for that? Oh, yeah. You know, but we also got a lot of po positive support as well. Uh, but we received threatening emails. How dare you punish oxygen breathers? You know, <laughs> we became in the middle of a war. Uh, so it, it, becoming political did, uh, it did harm us a bit, but we, we saw it through. But, yeah, we've been, we've been squeezed in a corner. We have to, you know, uh, can't You're discriminate. You're doing what you can. And, and, you know, when it comes to, you know, support for your position on this. Sometimes when something's going on and, and we don't like it, somebody comes up with a, a policy or a law yeah. to support the new thought. So, Dr. Canterbury, you know, here we've got a desperate situation. Are, do, are you getting the support that you really need? It's a great question. And again, it ties into the fact that us as black entrepreneurs, we're not always getting access to those things that we need to support our communities. And so what we really stride ourselves on doing is partnering with those nonprofits, those front facing customers to educate. It still comes back to educating and creating a safe space for people to speak their opinions or concerns on why they may not be vaccinated. No one should infringe on anyone's personal rights or freedom of liberty, of course. We know that. But when we start talking about the good of the public, the good of the community, your family, your loved ones, your children, we got to put things in perspective and not politicize every single thing, leading to worse outcomes for really the minority population. Well, the nation has not reached Biden's goal of 70 percent vaccinated. In fact, we're hovering around 56 percent. Now, considering the impact of the Delta variant, both he and the CDC are now saying we have a pandemic of the unvaccinated. <clears throat> Mary, this is sort of a new narrative out there, and I'm not sure how helpful it is. What are your thoughts? Well, yeah, as I said, that it's become this political cudgel instead of talking about the science which is why you get scenes where uh, on the floor of, uh, in Congress, you have doc, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's usually pretty calm, uh, <laughs> screaming uh, or He's raising his it. voice to <laughs> Senator Rand Paul saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, 
I, but I, at the same time, you do see some of these Republican governors changing their tune. Uh, when folks like Ron DeSantis in Florida, they were very lax about regulations and opening up and then saw the numbers about one in five of the new cases being in Florida. So he's encouraging people. The governor of Arkansas is going around encouraging people. You see that uh, the Alabama uh, governor, Kay Ivey, basically saying, listen, folks, get vaccinated. So I think this Delta variant and this fear of a surge, which would also affect businesses and the economy of the states, are putting some fear into folks. And even some folks who, who really you wouldn't expect are talking about the unvaccinated and that they need to go and get a shot. Uh, so it's been an interesting turn of events uh, when you talk about this messaging. Uh, and even on some conservative television networks, you see the hosts who had been very uh, skeptical talking about this surge and I, you know, I think the CDC warnings and the numbers have basically made some believers out of some folks. I think that that saying that this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated somewhat separates the vaccinated from the unvaccinated and may even be offensive to some degree. Yet we know Dr. Canterbury, 40% um, of people, about 40% of people walking around do not have a COVID vaccine for whatever reason. And they're not obligated to tell anybody about their status. What kind of risk are they taking if they have choice? Um, what kind of risk are they taking for themselves, for the unvaccinated community and for the vaccinated community? So being unvaccinated does put you at a substantial risk. And we are still discovering new long-term chronic issues that people get from COVID. And they are long lasting. I've had colleagues, I have patients, my own family members have gotten COVID within the last week or two. And they're having to quarantine. Because again, it, it may have been access, it may have been fears, it may have been concerns. No one should discredit any of your concerns. You should talk to someone that's trusted, but the risks are real. We see the numbers in other countries like India and South America. We have people roiling in that right now. And the numbers are real here. We're still seeing black and Latinos dying twice to three times higher than our white counterparts. So ultimately there's a risk of either you being unvaccinated and maybe spreading it to a loved one, a grandmother, an auntie, who, you know, also isn't vaccinated, that can put people in jeopardy. And when your family's in jeopardy, you don't want to be making decisions that are preventable um, on, a, on a hospital deathbed. Nobody wants that. Leonardo, what are your thoughts? You know, you're a business owner. You've worked with um, school communities as well, students, teachers. Um, it seems as though there's not necessarily a message that can compel anybody to go get a vaccine vaccination if they're anti-vaccine and they have every right to be. But um, what are you observing? And in terms of reaching that goal of 70 percent and maybe the, the whole idea of uh, vaccine hesitation, is that strong in our community? Yeah, you know, we're at war with disinformation. It, it's really, really real, uh, especially in the black community. Uh, one of the struggles that we dealt with as a business, as well as many of my colleagues across the city, is we have some of our staff who just refuse to get vaccinated, you know, and what that's causing is economic instability. You know, I uh, one thing that happened to us, we had a, a, a cook, a line cook, who had to take time off because he was around someone who was exposed. Now, fortunately, he didn't have it, but also he refused to get vaccinated. But when he left, I had to fill that space and being short staff causes another issue. You know, so now we're dealing with the internal instability of running a business, as well as the vulnerability of not knowing who is coming into your uh, your business. Mm -hmm. Dr. Canterbury, people are concerned about these breakthrough cases um, where people have received the vaccine but still got COVID. Do you think that that is contributing to vaccine vaccine hesitation? I can honestly say anything negative can be used to provide skepticism or hesitancy regarding anything with the vaccines. But the truth comes down to this. I do believe the term breakthrough cases is a bit of an anomaly. We know that these vaccines are not 100% at preventing illness. So if someone were to be vaccinated and get a case and it's mild or asymptomatic, I wouldn't quite characterize it as a breakthrough case. 
I would more so say those who are hospitalized or who are dying and they're vaccinated, those are the numbers that would give me more pause. And I would say those are technically breakthrough cases for me. The truth is the numbers are there. They don't lie. We got 99% of people in Maryland who recently had COVID, who were unvaccinated or the ones hospitalized or dying. We're seeing less than 1% of people who are vaccinated really having any hospitalizations or deaths, period. And this is about 5,500 people out of close to 160 million. So your percentages are still extremely, extremely low, even giving more reason to consider getting vaccinated. The risk is still there. We have widespread community spread. We are not at a point where we have this contained on regional levels, even though we do see some differences in vaccination. And so there's more people that are unvaccinated, there are still those very same risks of providing harm for your family. Well, certainly we hope that people will uh, be very thoughtful in considering what they choose to do and how it's going to impact their own homes and also the surrounding community. Dr. Le uh, Delon Canterbury, Mary C. Curtis, and Leonardo Williams, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. I want to thank today's guests, and we invite you to engage with us on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag Black Issues Forum. You can also find our full episodes on pbsnc.org slash Black Issues Forum or listen at any time on Apple iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Deborah Holt-Noel. Thanks for watching. through the financial contributions of viewers like you who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.